Hey, we're starting a new series today, and um, it's a series that's been building in my heart for a long time. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and apologize up front for probably how long this series is going to be. I've tried to keep each message short, but we're going to be here for a couple months, all right? Because we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to stay there. Uh, because as I read the beginning of this word, uh, the more and more I focus on each word, each phrase, each uh, element, each perspective of creation, there's, there's just waves of, of thoughts, waves of ideas, waves of how relevant that is to us today that keep coming over me. Because what, what is described in the first two chapters here is the world we were made for. It's, it's, what, it's what we were created for. And honestly, the reason this is so important is because some of you have never realized that one point. You feel the dissonance in your life. You feel like things that aren't quite right. You, you, you wrestle through some anxiety. You wrestle through the difficulty of sin. You wrestle through the temptation and the, the cycle of, uh, you know, hey, I got to get better. got to do better. Okay, I got like two weeks here of success. And then, boom, you know, right back to where. And you're like, why, why is this so hard? Some of you wrestle in, in marriage and, and you struggle through it. I mean, divorce statistics, are they are what they are. I mean, almost half of the marriages in our country end in divorce. And, and you're like, what, is, is it even worth it? And honestly, there's a whole generation that's growing up that's asking that exact question. And the reason they're exact, asking that exact question is because they've watched their parents struggle through this thing. And you're like, well, like well, it's just, why, is it, why is it so hard? And listen, all of those questions and so many more, when you feel that dissonance, when you feel like something's not quite right, about how you, you want life to go, or you should, like you gotta realize the world that you're living in, everything about this world that you're living in, you were not designed for. The world we're gonna talk about for the next couple of months, that's the world that we were made for. It's a world of perfection. It's a world where everything is as it should be, where everything is right, where the order is correct. And when we move away, like we don't even have to move away, just being born in this world means we're away. We're away from perfection. We just are. And so we're gonna, we're gonna take the first couple of chapters, first three chapters of the Bible, and we're just gonna anchor there. And we're just gonna cover, honestly, each week we're just gonna cover phrases. So I got, we're gonna get through the first five words today. Is that good? Think you can handle that? All right, here's the first four. All right, I'm not gonna give you the fifth one yet. All right? In the beginning, God. That's it. In the beginning, God. If you can stop there without letting your you know, heart and mind like race on, you know, oh, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? In the beginning, What is that? Well, whenever the beginning was, this is where we're at, in the beginning, at the very start. The Bible doesn't make an argument for what kind of God this is, how many there are, all that you know, we debate about. It just asserts a definitive statement that says, in the beginning, God. So the Bible claims up front that in the beginning, God, God exists. He exists. Uh, reality is the perfect world that he created, he created for you to exist in, worshiping him as existing. In the beginning, God. Well, the rest of the Bible gives us a lot uh, more information about what happens at this very moment, all right? 
And so I wanna read a couple passages for you because like when we talk about in the beginning God, what does that mean? Well, through the different scriptures that are written, we get a fuller picture of who this God is. Uh, you know, the next phrase or the next verse talks about and the, the, the spirit of the Lord's hovering over the water. So, so there's something in there that the, the, this God is, is expressed in spirit hovering over. As the writers of the New Testament are directed by God to record also what happens here, Colossians writes this, like, I'm gonna give you these verses somehow because all of these verses are so vital to understanding the whole. So keep up, all right? But I'll give you a list. Colossians says this, Christ, Jesus, he's the the visible image of the invisible God. So in the beginning, God, that God is invisible. That God is spirit, But then Jesus comes and he's the visible image of the invisible God. And look what it says about Jesus. He existed before anything was created. So in the beginning, God existed. Before anything else was created, he was. And he was spirit and he was Jesus. That's what he says. He, Jesus, that he existed before anything was created. And look what it says about him. And he is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realm and on earth. So God, in the beginning, he's spirit, and he exists as spirit. And he also exists in the person of Jesus Christ. And God created the world through Jesus. So I know that some of you are like, okay, I thought Jesus only came on the scene at Christmas and that's what we, you know, no, no, no. Like this Jesus existed before anything was created. And he's the one that that formed everything. Look what it says, he made the things that we can see. He also made the things we can't see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities of the unseen world. He made this world and all that we can see and all that science is continuing to just continue to to search and discover. And I mean, the, the volume of discovery is just multiplying over and over and over again every day, every year as we discover and try to plumb the depths of of the the, the created world that we can see. But there's a whole nother realm that Jesus formed, that he created, that is all unseen. And we're gonna get to that here in a second. Everything was created. This is everything was created, one, through him. You were made by Jesus everything that was created. And then here's the purpose. Everything was made through him and what? And for him. We were designed by him. We were also designed for him. And it brings an intent, a purpose to why we were created. And part of that purpose, in fact, the totality of that purpose is that we were created for him. He existed before anything else and then, and he holds all creation together. Another passage, John chapter one, at the very beginning of the gospel of John, it kind of echoes the same idea of Genesis and it says, it's talking about Jesus, the word, that was made flesh, and it says he existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. And the word did this. The word gave life. The word 
brought life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. So here we are in the very beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God's spirit, God's invisible, and God is Jesus. And there is no beginning to those beings. It's, it's one God. Different persons, if you will. But everything that God the Father, we're gonna call that right now, even though Genesis doesn't present it that way yet, everything that the God the Father did, he did through the Son. And everything that the Son created, which is everything that we can see and everything we can't see, made by him and made for him. You were made for him. Your purpose in life is about being made for Jesus. So in the beginning, God. Fifth word, created. This word created. It's literally ex nihilo. It's, it's out of or from nothing. This is, God created and he didn't start with raw materials. You know, we do all kinds of creation. Everything is, is like, we celebrate, the, the, like, wow, man, you created this, or you designed this, you painted this, you built this. You, like, all that we do in our creation, all that we do in all of our creativity, we start with raw materials. In fact, all that we think is, is, is amazing in creativity. I mean, the greatest works of art in the history of the world, somebody created that marble that got chipped away. Somebody made that paint, and that somebody, the raw materials, was God. So all that we do to create, all that we do to design, all that we do to celebrate and get celebrated by, all of that is based on the foundation of raw materials that God provides for us. He doesn't start with raw materials. He creates out of nothing. Out of nothing. How many of you heard that before? Yeah. It's... It's vital to understand the creativity of God and the design of God that he creates out of nothing because he doesn't have to recreate yet because what he creates out of nothing isn't flawed to begin with. It didn't exist to begin with. It's ex nihilo. It's out of nothingness God makes something through Jesus. And so God didn't come along and say, oh, here's this like messed up galaxy here. Let me like, let me form, let me work on that a little bit. No, he, he designed it from nothing exactly the way he wanted it. And because he designed this way, he, he has the right he has the right to declare anything to be any way he wishes, period. In the beginning, God, that doesn't seem like a challenging statement. But honestly, for every one of us in this room, it should feel very challenging. Because to declare and to affirm that in the beginning, God created means that he's above all, means that he gets, to, he gets to define, he has the right to define what it is that he made, how it's to function, and it's perfect. And so this whole series is really called design because our goal in this is to, to get you to focus in on the design of God, the, the creativity of God, and the, the 
the structure that he puts in place, the way this is what we were made for. See, what he creates right here in Genesis 1 and 2, it is, it is the world that we were made for. And all of the dissonance and all of the discord and all the frustration that is in your life is a result of you living in a world that you were, were not created for. Because sin in our lives, moving away from the designer, moving away from his intent, has thrown the whole atmosphere and all that was creation into chaos. And it's not just out there either. It's thrown our own hearts, our own souls, our own lives into chaos. But just because we exist in this chaos, that's, that's the beauty of Genesis 1 and 2. Because Genesis 1 and 2 describe a world where sin doesn't exist yet. There's three chapters in the Bible that, that, that are written in the context where sin doesn't exist. It's the first two and the last one. That's it. Everything in between is, is wrestling through all of creation that has stepped away from God's design. And so as we wrestle through this, we got to focus in on this design because you really do have a choice at each step of the way, at each topic that we move through, at each phrase that we go through. It's, it's, it's not just a phrase, it is setting the tone. It is defining what reality is. It's defining what is true, the way God intent, his design of all of it. And there's a choice that you have to make in each statement. You have to say, yes, I'm going to affirm God in the beginning, you created. Or, I'm going to believe a distortion of that design. One way or other. It's, it, it's, it's two choices. It's you believe in this design or you believe in the deceit. And that kind of brings into a, a whole nother perspective, if you will, because we get to Genesis chapter three and we'll get there in the coming weeks and get a little bit more clear. But there's a, a being, unseen world created being, created by Jesus and his design or his desire, I should say, is to deceive. And he sets himself up against the God of creation. The problem with, with this, we're gonna call him Satan for right now, we're gonna call it evil one. I like the evil one. The problem that he has is this. He cannot create ex nihilo. He doesn't have that power. He can't create a world on his own. He has to work with raw materials that somebody else, God, created. I think if he had the power to create out of nothing, he would, but he doesn't have that power. So all that he's left with is to distort what God created out of nothing and to deceive. See, the reason God has kind of led us to this point in the next few months to dive in here is this. Satan always takes, always takes what God intended and designed for good and he seeks to distort it in such a way that you'll believe the distortion and you'll be deceived by that distortion and then you'll move from that deception into destruction. That's the pathway of the evil one. And so when God creates order in creation, and as you read through Genesis 1, it, the order of it is, is unmistakable. He's forming and bringing order and design at every point. And, and, and by the time evil gets done with it, all of creation is thrown into chaos. And so out of this order, 
the evil one creates chaos. The fact that Genesis 1 talks about each of us in this room, and every person you'll ever lay, lay eyes on is created. Like we, we bear the image of God in some way. We're gonna spend a whole Sunday on this. We bear the image of God in some way that none, no other part of creation does. We are God's image bearers on this earth, distinct, different from all other parts of creation. And one of the enemy's tools to distort and destroy it is to figure out how he can get image bearers to kill each other. And so just wrap up all killing in this one world. You know, you know God, God's so judgment, like do not kill. No, no. Well, that's pretty good, you know, that's a good starting place to live by, okay? But there's so much more than that. Because the evil one's intent is to snuff out the image of God on this earth. How does he do that? Snuff us out. We live in a country where we've snuffed out over 60 million image bearers in the last 40 so years. We live in a government that, that pays for it now. And we don't just, we don't just take that payment and, 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 and execute image bearers in this country. We have to export that as well around the world. And now we're paying for it around the world. Like that's what the evil one does. The evil one takes a command that says be fruitful and multiply. That's a fun thing, right? Like let's, let's be fruitful and multiply. And the, the evil one distorts that and says no, 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 no. This is worldwide and it's happening more and more. And I thought maybe it doesn't make it to our country. It's just a matter of time. You start hearing Because whether it began in China or somewhere else, it's, it's no, 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 one child, it's enough. And, and, and one policy that says, no, 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 just one child, one child, because the earth is gonna get overcrowded. And I, I, I guess these people haven't been to Texas. <laughs> I mean, like genuinely. Like this whole line of thinking is such a farce but it is the evil one setting himself up against a, an original design command. Hey, be fruitful and multiply. No, 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 not too much. Be fruitful, multiply, just once. Have you ever had a garden, like a, a tree, that, a perennial that, that comes back, like it bears fruit every year, and it bears one orange, one year, and then that was it? It, 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 it doesn't happen. This wasn't designed to do that. Be fruitful and multiply. We're gonna talk about that. But the enemy comes in and says, no, 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 no. Let's cut that off. Genesis talks about the one flesh, sexual union, the beauty and the joy of all that's wrapped up in that. And the evil one comes up and says, hey, all that God created and designed imperfection and the goodness of it, we're going to distort it. We're gonna distort it so far that, that, that it's not even recognizable anymore, that it is used as a tool of violence instead of joy, the goodness of God. And that's what evil does. He, he twists it, he perverts it instead of a, a place of of union and joy together, it's made into a, a control mechanism of power and abuse to the point that, you know, we gotta fight hard just to get back to the idea that God even made sex to begin with. Because it is, 
in our, in our kids' minds, in our students' minds, in young adults' minds, it is so distorted that they can't imagine that God designed it and created it. That's what the evil one does. The beauty and the gift of being male and female, I never thought in my day I'd preach a controversial message on he made them male and female. And look at the world we live in, where unfortunately that's up for debate now. Tomorrow night, our town, our little town, Harrisburg, they're gonna consider an ordinance. This is happening, guys. I've, I've been told as of last night that they're not voting on it, but even that information is not clear. But right up here, town hall, we're gonna vote, or they're gonna, they're gonna, they have a nonprofit who's gonna present an ordinance. I've got an ordinance if you want, you know, if you want to touch base with me, I'll send it to you. That man, it sounds so good. It sounds like, how could you disagree with this? And the reality of how it's worked out in other cultures around the world, as well as in our own country, is destruction. The people who shout, let's follow the science, let's follow the science, guys. Can't quite follow science on this one, can they? I mean, basic, male, female, science. They can't go there. Because even that has to get distorted. It's gotta be twisted into rejecting God's design. In the beginning, God created. He defines it. He decides it. Even the gift of the diversity of creation, man, I am enthralled by the diversity of creation. This might sound really stupid. But I am enthralled by color. Like color intrigues me. And not just color that I see in everybody, you know, what you wear. Because everything that you wear, <laughs> you, you Somebody made that not out of nothing, but out of something. So that doesn't intrigue me. What intrigues me is the brilliance of color that God made out of nothing. And there's two places that I see it more than anything else. I see it in fish, particularly the tropical ones, and in birds. Like, like, like who does that? Have you, have you seen anything like that? I mean, I've never been, I've never been scuba diving, but like, I'm, I've been snorkeling everywhere I could possibly go snorkeling. Just like the dash of color, it's, it's amazing. And, and this is a God who, who made this out of nothing. Like, I, I don't know how he does it. He's God. The diversity of color, all the way down to the, like we look at it and we're like, like that bird, that fish, that animal, like the distinction is amazing. The contrast is amazing. Even with our kids, like the animals they gravitate to, usually they're, they're ones that have contrast. And so, because that cheetah and the spots stick out and that giraffe is just different and that zebra is like, wow, I like, it just is. It's amazing. He, he created that out of nothing, all the diversity. And nobody's even gonna argue with that diversity out there, right? I mean, you're not mad at the fish, right? Nobody in here is mad at fish, right? Nobody's mad at the birds. Nobody's mad at the giraffes. But somehow, the diversity of the pigment of our own skin color somehow is the, the, the very context for war. Crazy. I mean, insanity. 
Like we look at the, the diversity that God made and somehow we, we, we turn it. Evil has turned it into a war. There's one race, people. One race. There's only one race. Period. Why do I know that? Because I read the first couple chapters here. That's it. And throughout the history of time, people have used that diversity and said, oh, that's bad, this is good, me, I'm always in the good category, right? Always put ourselves. Here's how, here's what the Bible says about all of this, okay? It's, a, it's, it's God, in the beginning, God, he designed it, he created it, this is how it works, this is perfection, this is a God who loves us, who created a world for us to enjoy and step into the way he designed it. And the evil one who can't create crap, literally, he can't even create crap. Parents, sorry. <laughs> Children's ministry starting next week. <laughs> I've been really good, I feel like, for the last several months. <laughs> sorry. He can't create. And so all he can do is distort. All he can do is, is take what God designed and trick you into thinking that that design is not good. I'm gonna bring up a word here and you're gonna be like, ooh, here we go. Okay? It's not that big a deal. It's just the reality of the Bible. Because as the Bible reveals more and more of God's will, it also reveals more and more of how this world is distorted. And it says this about part of that unseen world that Jesus also created. He created everything that's seen. He's created everything that's unseen, everything, including this part. But remember, it was Jesus, the Christ, who, who formed everything in the beginning. And so the person or the, the force that is opposite of Christ is anti-Christ. It's not even creative. But when we come up with this term, anti-Christ, we're like, ooh, you know, like four horsemen, apocalypse, here we go, you know, whoa. No, 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 let's not go there, because I think that's a trick of the enemy. That's a trick of the Antichrist to get you to think that talking about the Antichrist is weird. When in reality, who created the world? Jesus, the Christ. All that we're talking about, all the distortion, all the destruction that happens, it's just simply Antichrist. That's it. So let's look at it. First John chapter two. I'm gonna have to hustle, all right? Keep up with me. Dear children, this is, this is John, the Apostle John, writing towards the end of his life. Dear children, the last hour is here. You've heard that the Antichrist is coming. You've heard he's coming. And already many such Antichrists have appeared. This is amazing to me. I don't have any time. Okay, listen. The, the Antichrist has no idea the timetable of the Father. We covered this several months ago. Jesus doesn't, Jesus, the son, doesn't even know the father's timetable. He says, like, the disciples are like, hey, when's all this gonna happen? When's the end gonna come? All Jesus is like, I don't even know. Like, the father sets those time. That's not my job. If Jesus doesn't know, you think anybody else knows? No, nobody else knows. The Antichrist doesn't know, the real Antichrist. So what does he have to do? What does he have to do to be ready for the time where God comes and brings back perfection. What does he have to do? He has to continually be forming new antichrists. Not the antichrist, but he has to always have one ready because he doesn't know the timetable. 
I think we can look through history and we could probably point out a couple, be careful with that. But I'd, I'd, I'd put, you know, put Hitler in that category. I think he was a pretty powerful antichrist that the antichrist had ready, just in case. I'm gonna put Mar- Margaret Sanger in that, that category. You can, you can kind of figure out, Nero, we'll, we'll go there, it's way back. You have heard the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. That's what John said. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people, these Antichrist, people who are against God's design, these people, they left our churches so they were here to begin with at one point, John's saying. Don't think that the the Antichrist is just out there. If you think that, that's first deception, okay? Okay. Reality, John says it, not me. Y'all realize that I didn't write any of this, right? That's all we're doing. Okay, these people left our churches but they never really belonged to us, otherwise they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us but you are not like that. For you, the Hol- for, for the Holy One has given you his spirit and all of you know the truth, okay? Listen. So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between the truth and a lie. At the very end of this book, John's writing, and he's saying, hey, the difference between the truth, design and distortion. Design is the truth. Distortion is the lie. Design is the truth. Deceit is the lie. And then he says, and who is a liar? You wanna know who a liar is? I wanna know who a liar is. This is who a liar is. Anyone who says Jesus is not the Christ, period. Doesn't matter how good a person they are. We got a lot of great people on the face of the earth. I've got a lot of great friends. They do not affirm that Jesus is the Christ. So they're liars. Anyone who denies the Father and Son if you say, no, Jesus wasn't around in the beginning, no, he didn't create all this, no, he doesn't have to, he didn't create it for him, like, you're a liar. That's how we know. Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Not the antichrist, not ooh, but an antichrist against created order. Anyone who denies the son doesn't have the father either. Do you know how many people say, hey, that's okay, I, I'm gonna worship my own God. I got my own pathway to God and I've got meditation over here and I do this and I'm, and, and listen, most of these people, I got good, they're, they're a lot of my friends. And they just say like, hey, I, there's a lot of ways to get to God. And I'm just telling you, First John says, no, you're a liar. Anyone who denies the son doesn't have the father. If you, you can't deny Jesus and, and be in fellowship with God, it just, it's impossible. That's a deception. But anyone who acknowledges the son has the father also. They're a package deal. It's always been that way. Not, not since Christmas, it, it's, it's always been that way in the beginning. Then look, 1 John chapter four. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Please, God, do not, <laughs> do not believe everyone who says, the Spirit says this, it sounds godly, it sounds spiritual. They even sound more spiritual than you do. And that's why you, oh, I'm gonna pay attention. They seem more spiritual, they go to church, they talk about the Spirit. I don't even talk about the Spirit. Do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. This is how we know. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in the real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, 
That person is not from God. Listen, whether you're in the Antichrist camp or you're in God's camp, everything about that difference has to do with Jesus, the Christ, period. I mean, like, you don't even need a spiritual like, degree. You don't need anything like, to understand that, right? This is just great, solid, blue-collar language. Listen, just Bible interpretation for you. Just think of the like salt of the earth people that you know, okay? The farmer, the truck driver, the elementary school teacher, okay? Like just great people. Maybe let's back the teachers out of that. Not that they're not great people, but they're a little more, let's say, educated, okay? But when you read the Bible, particularly the more educated you become, the more you need to get in touch with what Joe Schmo would understand if he read it. And sometimes you need to get really in touch. <laughs> My wife has an uncle, Uncle Holt. He's a plumber. And anytime I like, I wonder, you know, get all like, oh, this, this, this. And then like confused a little bit because I got too much education. Literally one of the filters in my mind, what would Holt think? Holt thing, hey buddy, let me tell you what that says. I can hear him now. You can hear him, can't you? Hey buddy. And it's just plain, it's plain. It's not complex. Anybody that's trying to get you into that complexity of the scriptures, you're like, oh, well, that, he says that, but it really means this, 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 this. Just watch out. Just go to the plumber interpretation. God didn't make it so complex that we couldn't understand it. And then we have, have Princeton degrees to understand it. It's stupid. It's the enemy's trick to educate certain people to let you know so that you can be like the stupid masses and that you need like a priest to tell you what it means. And the priests, they start running out of control so they keep it in a foreign language so that you can't read it. So the priest, the priest, this actually happened because one of them said, hey, let's interpret it into English and let's give it to the people. You know what they did to that priest? They burned him at the stake. Because we can't let common blue collar plumbers actually read the scripture. We'll lose all of our power. We'll lose all of our control. Let's keep all of our services in Latin that nobody speaks. This is insanity, people. And that's the history of the church. The Catholic church, who still conducts a lot of services in Latin. But you know what? Other religions, they learned from this. We're fighting religion in the middle of Ethiopia. It's an Orthodox church. You know who the priests are? They're the, they're the priests, they're the connected class. They also happen to be the wealthy people. Who knew? But you know what, when we took a solar light and gave everybody on the island a light, you know who was mad at us? The priest, why was the priest mad? Because he's the only one that's got a generator. And he has a store every night that everybody on the island comes and buys soda because he's the only one that has refrigeration. You see how this works? It's power, it's control. They also teach all of their religious service in a language called geese. It's not even a spoken language anymore. I'm confident the priests I speak to, they don't even know what geese is. But yeah, they're the ones, the only ones that have interpreted this spiritual language and they have a spiritual book and all you masses out there, we're way too educated for you to ever understand, so just listen to us. And it's control, manipulation, and when freedom of Christ comes, because we teach Christ, and 14 teenage boys say, yes, I believe that's the Christ. You know what they do? When they go back to the island after we baptize them, you know what they do? They say, no, 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 no. You're not stepping foot on this island. Wait, wait a minute. We live here. No, 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 not anymore. You can live here if you let us re-baptize you into us but you, you have no place here. That's, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. That's the manipulation. Not out there in the world, right here in the church throughout all history. All right. 
It's going to be a good series. I, like, I'm telling you guys, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to feel some anger because I watch manipulation and I watch control and I watch the power that people that, that, that yield that. And you see it in an in a isolated, desperate third world country where poverty and death is rampant. Literally, they hate me and us at this church so much. We took four cases of school supplies for their school. Literally, just drop them off. No, 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 we don't want your stuff. No, 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 like, like we don't even have to go on the island. We'll just send it. No, 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 no. We don't need your stuff. Yeah, 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 but we're gonna build a well like we've built four before, we don't need your clean water. That's the Antichrist. Called a priest. Manipulation, control, I've seen it. And somebody's gotta get pissed about it. Because it's blowing straight through our country. Um, if a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges Jesus Christ, okay, here we go. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming to the world and indeed is already here. But you, but you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in in you is greater than the spirit who lives in this world. Listen, don't feel like I've got this strength or anything. Like I am scared to death when I go in these situations. I am petrified at times by the power of evil because that evil one, that deceiver, he is much more powerful than I am. And that's why John's writing this, hey, like, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. We don't have to be afraid. We have to trust what's in here. I belong to God, God's spirit's in here, and that spirit, I'm not relying on my own strength, but that spirit's greater than anything I'm gonna face out there. These, those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's point of view, and the world listens to them. Listen, the world's always gonna be this way. John said it. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they don't listen to us. That is how we know if someone has a spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Listen, the clearest point that you're going to get through this series is you're going to understand who has the spirit of truth and who has the spirit of deception. Because as we point out different specific topics, specific phrases in the perfect created order, you're going to be like, oh, that person's against that. You're right, they have the spirit of deception. Hey, they never listen to me. Well, duh. That's what it says. Here's the thing about design and deception, all right? We're gonna go this over and over and over again. Design leads to freedom and life. God created a design, and as we, as we step into that design, what our life gets to enjoy is freedom and gets to enjoy life, like abundant life, life beyond this life. Life that's great in spite of this life. Deceit is gonna lead to slavery and ultimately death. And that's on every single one of these topics. This is how this works out. This is the last verse I'm gonna cover and then we're done. Thanks for hanging in. I wanna read this because the, the, the distinction between these two worlds, like the pathway of somebody moving from design to deceit is spelled out step by step by step. And we're gonna see it all through this series. Like today is kinda like the, like the overview of all that we're gonna dive into. Romans chapter one is this. 
But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. This is what sinful, wicked people do, okay? God didn't declare them sinful and wicked. He says they're sinful and wicked because this, they suppress the truth. What is that? They just say, I'm not designed that way. I know God, you're a designer. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna suppress that truth. The first step, the first step in moving from design to deception is for you to just not acknowledge the truth of a designer. It's the first step. Because they, they suppress the truth by their wickedness. Listen, they know the truth about God. They, are, they, they know it. Because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not following God. They have to suppress the created truth that hits them in the face every day in a new color of a new animal that's created out of nothing. They have to say, ah. No, 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 you were made by a designer. No, I wasn't. I made myself. I made by my mom and dad. And I get to decide what I'm designed for. Yes, they knew God, but listen, they didn't only suppress the truth, they wouldn't worship him as God. Listen, when we come together and we worship, we're not just singing songs. We're not just, oh, it's a great time. No, 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 we're, we're literally doing exactly what those who get deceived don't do. We had a worship night, Monday night. It was phenomenal. What a great time. 100 or so people right here in this room just worshiping. We got another one coming up on March 1st. Put it on your calendar. Because that's what they wouldn't, yeah, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or give him thanks. And then they began to think up foolish idea of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, claiming to be Harvard educated, claiming to be the new scientist of the day, claiming to be the smartest, claiming to be the educated, claiming to be their own designer, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worship idols to, made to look like mere people and birds and animals, like the same birds and animals that, that God created with all of their intricacy and all their color and all their design. You know what, you know what humans did? They recreate those things. They can't even create a new idea, like at least come up with a new animal. They, but they, they, they form something that is not even anywhere as intriguing as the original thing. Because you can't create that color. You can't create that distinction. You can't create that intricate design. You just can't. We can't even mimic breast milk, guys. I mean, like, is that not amazing? Do you know the power of like breast milk? I know it's really weird, but where we get there, it's design, guys. All of our scientists, all of our wisdom, all of the world's wisdom can't duplicate breast milk. <laughs> Holy cow, man. But we'll form a cow that doesn't even have spots and we'll put it up there and we'll bow down to it. Unbelievable, guys. Unbelievable. Claiming to be wise, we become utter fools who bow down to pieces of wood with very dull paint on them. Oh, gosh. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols to make look like mere people and birds and animals. So God, it's the saddest verse. So God said, okay, guys, do what you want. 
He abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's body. They traded the truth. They traded, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. In the beginning, God created. It's not that controversial, and yet now it is. Now it's the topic. Because are you gonna worship and serve the things God created, or are you gonna worship as him as the creator? It's design or deception, you choose. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandons them to their foolish thinking. And he lets them do things that should never be done. Their lives become full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, evil, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. Listen, they go beyond that. They invent new ways of sinning because the old ways get boring. They invent, they create, not out of nothing, they use what God gave them and they invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents, they refuse to understand, they break their promises, they're heartless, they have no mercy. Cancel culture is running rampant through our world. It's a culture who has no mercy. no mercy. Everybody that I want to be perfect has to be perfect because there's no mercy. That's the Antichrist. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. They know their destiny. They know it. And yet they do them anyway. And then even worse, worse yet, they encourage other people to do them. And yet all those people that do that, they're not our enemy. They've just been people who have moved away from design. They've embraced deception. And the evil one, listen, the evil one has run roughshod over their lives. This church, let me tell you, this church, if you're, if you're over here and you've bought into deception, listen, we all have. That's why we're here. That's why we get to worship. Because we're coming from all kinds of deception. We're coming from all kinds of broken places. People in this room have invented new ways to sin. Look to your neighbor and say, good job. Because that got you here. And we're a church Man, we are built, we are built to rescue. We're made for this, guys. We don't reject any kind of brokenness. We say, come on in, come on in. I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've done. I know this, that all of us in this room have bought into deceit at some point. In the first couple of chapters, when I read them, like it, it's like a world that calls to me and says, come, like you're made for this world, not this world. You got a choice. You got a choice. Design or deceit. Design, you worship God who created you. You buy into it. You believe it even when you don't want to maybe? Even when it doesn't make sense because the wise people out there tell you it doesn't make sense? When you do, it leads to freedom. It leads to life. But if you buy into the deceit, it, 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 it puts you in slavery. It puts you in slavery. I'd like, man, I'm not just preaching the Bible, guys. I get calls, I get texts. I'm at the bottom, I'm at the bottom, I'm at the bottom. I'm like, I'm so glad you texted me. I'm so glad you called me. We're a church for the bottom. Because we've all been there. And we know that you got deceived and it led you into slavery. And that slavery is just working out death in your life. 
You were made for Eden. You're made for a perfect garden. But instead of the places where we've all ruined it, where we've all wrecked it, instead of leaving us to that, Jesus, the one who created us all and designed us all through him and designed it for him, he's not done. He says, look, I know you've ruined it. So I'm gonna step away from my ex nihilo created place as creator of the whole world and all that's in it, and I'm going to become flesh. I'm gonna become created. Not really. I'm gonna take on flesh. And I'm gonna die so that when you hit the bottom, you can look up and I'm right here. And I'm gonna call other people who are my followers, they're gonna be there too. Because we weren't made for this world. Whatever, listen, for some of you, you're like, finally, I found a church that could actually teach this. Unfortunately, it's rare. And then some of you, You know this hits, and you know it's a struggle point. Different topics. I'm gonna dive into all of them. I'm not gonna apologize for anything. But whatever you're seeking, the Bible says you're gonna find it. Just are. Whatever you're seeking, you'll find it. If your heart is seeking a designer who made you, who created you for a perfect world and is ready to come and restore you and get you ready for that perfect future. You'll find it. But if you are looking for a deceiver because you just want somebody to lie to you, we all want that at some point in our life. If you just want somebody to lie to you, you'll find it. Enemy will come. Deceiver will be there. That's what salvation is. It's Jesus saying, let me bring you back to what you were made for. You were made for Eden. And just because we've ruined it doesn't mean that God's done. You're made for this. You're designed for it because God's our designer. In the beginning, God created. Let's pray. God, we worship you. We love you. We thank you that you made us. I thank you for the diversity that you created in this room, in this community, in this country, in this world. Help us to worship you as the designer. Protect us and guide us. We pray in Jesus' name.